This is the Plagman Rules Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Friday edition. It's Friday, August 11th. All right, and on today's show, we're going to talk about three big topics here. The first one is going to be this big spread coming out about The Last Jedi that's been revealed courtesy of Entertainment Weekly. The second thing we'll talk about, and actually the last two topics are both going to be about Netflix, we're going to talk about David Letterman returning to the discussion points here with a Netflix series, and about another streaming service. Disney's launching their own streaming service. We'll kind of have a few comments about that as well. Okay, so let's get started. The big thing we're going to talk about today is this Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi kind of news, kind of big news break here with everything that they've revealed in the most recent edition of Entertainment Weekly. So the big thing we're going to talk about here, the biggest thing I've taken away from this is a few comments about Luke Skywalker, about why he's the way he is, why he's kind of turned into this old hermit kind of creature in this new trilogy. And the comments that were made there kind of revealing a little bit of what the story is going to be. So the comments here made by Hamill... This has kind of given me my first doubt, actually, into The Last Jedi. This is something, I might be alone on this, but there's this whole idea here, I'll kind of explain this quick. Basically, what Hamill is saying is that the reason why Luke has gone off onto this island by himself and why he's not in the thick of it in The Force Awakens was because when he was training Kylo, also known as Ben Solo, that's, you know, played by Adam Driver, that... During his training, he discovered him and thought this was the Chosen One, which is, of course, a reference to the prequel films where everybody thought that Anakin Skywalker was the Chosen One and, you know, and all that. So what happened was when Kylo turned and now became Kylo Ren and became this, you know, big, dark, evil thing, Luke felt entirely guilty about it and he took off. So here's my question. Number one, I'm somebody who believes that the prequel films and that Star Wars episodes one through three, in case uh, you need any clarification there, those movies are not good. Revenge of the Sith is all right, but the other two really, I mean, you could have disposed of them and made the prequel into one film. Sure, there would have been some gaping holes here and there if you leave it as it is, but add a little more backstory to that. You know, you could have made it one film that was actually worthwhile, but as it is, yeah, I'm not a huge prequel fan. And even though I grew up with the movies and I loved them as a kid, nowadays I look at them and I'm like, what was I on to think that these were so good? Now, of course, the original trilogy is where it's all at. So my big thing with this one, with the Chosen One statement is the Chosen One is Darth Vader. What are you talking about, Luke? I mean, for me personally, I don't see any reason to go back to this Chosen One nonsense. You know, the way I'm looking at the whole saga here, Darth Vader slash Anakin Skywalker was the Chosen One. He was prophesized and prophecies in movies are not always my favorite part of the mythology and stuff. Like the whole prophecy thing in the Harry Potter series, I could have done away with that. And the whole prophecy with the prequel things, again, I, I don't necessarily think it's a key thing that is needed. So here's the thing. The prophecy was that Anakin would rise up and destroy the Sith. Now, it took him a while, and it took him a turn to the dark side to figure that out, but he accomplished his goal. His goal was to destroy the Sith, based on this prophecy and all that shit. He became Darth Vader, yeah, but then at the end of the day, he took out the Emperor. And at the end of the day, he also was killed, you know, due to, you know, everything that happened with him in Return of the Jedi, with Luke cutting off his hand and everything, and he took on some Force lightning as well. I mean, the dude was not going to make it anyway. So, in a way, he did bring balance to the Force the way that the Chosen One in this prophecy was supposed to. To. Now, of course, the thing is, the original movies were made in the late 70s, early 80s. So George Lucas didn't have this whole prophecy idea in the books. And if you believe that, then you're a stupid idiot fanboy, okay? You can't believe that Lucas knew every last goddamn detail about what the prequels were going to be back in 1982 when he was filming Return of the Jedi. It's just not the way that things work. So this really brings me to the question, okay, so how did Luke find out about this Chosen One prophecy then? Because Obi-Wan never mentions it, Yoda never mentions it. In a way, it's almost like they are intending Luke to be the Chosen One, which, you know, and I'm not saying overall that this couldn't work, and this might be the way they go about it in the movie, is that, okay, we thought Anakin was the Chosen One, so we gave up hope on him when he turned to the dark side. So then here comes his son, Luke, who, you know, becomes a Jedi. Maybe he's the Chosen One. But then, oh, technically, Vader brought balance to the Force with his sacrifice and everything, so maybe Luke isn't the Chosen One, and maybe Vader was. Boom, that's the end of the conversation. Why would they bring up this whole Chosen One discussion to Luke? If not, how did he find out about it? You know, is there, and we've been teasing 
teased, yeah, maybe there's like this whole library, you know, in the first Jedi Temple and all that, that maybe that was how he discovered the prophecy. I mean, again, that's a way it, they can make that work. But just the way that I was taking it and the way that it was phrased and, and everything here, it just gives me this idea that, no, it was Obi-Wan or Yoda, their ghost or their force ghost, whatever, that told Luke about this whole prophecy and the Chosen One thing. And personally, this is another case of the sequel movies spinning on the wheels of the original and now the prequel trilogies and really not introducing a solo story that's new and original. Now, to kind of close this out here, I thought that The Force Awakens, as it was, was a fun movie. And it was really well done and everything. The special effects were all great. A lot of the performances were really nice. My big problem was that the main story of the movie was basically a copy and paste of A New Hope, just with a couple of different spins here and there. Now, obviously, yes, we have like a female lead in this one, and there's a major character who's African-American in this, and there wasn't one in the original. But I get those. Those are obvious ones. But the basic gist of the story, you know, from Force Awakens to New Hope is pretty much 98% the same outside of those few little appearance changes here and there, if you get what I mean. So yeah, in that regard, yeah, The Force Awakens is a bit of a disappointment in that regard with the story not being an original take and everything, and it relied, I think, too heavily on A New Hope for it to become one of the best Star Wars movies of all time. But this is the first time, really, that The Last Jedi has given me a reason to say, well, maybe that's all these new sequel films are going to be, is just repetition of both the original and the prequel trilogies put into this new perspective, which, you know, that's fine and everything. I mean, obviously, Obviously, Force Awakens worked, and it made a boatload of money and everything, but, I don't know, for me personally, I would just rather these be original stories and be off on their own, and yeah, of course, you can have winks, you can have little nods to the audience and stuff about stuff that happened in the past, and, you know, visual cues and all that, sure, I'm not gonna complain too hard about that, but just this whole idea, and again, this is just the way I'm interpreting it from the way it's been reported in Entertainment Weekly, this seems like another recycling in this new trilogy, which I really just does not get me excited about this. Okay, we got a lot of news with this Entertainment Weekly stuff, so we'll kind of not take as much time on the rest of these, but we'll kind of highlight a couple of things here and there. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about here, again, this will kind of be a little more brief, but John Boyega's character, Finn, we kind of get a couple of story details about him, and his character, of course, in The Force Awakens was a former stormtrooper who was fed up with everything, couldn't do it, and went over to the Resistance, and now, so far, he's kind of, you know, become something of a respected hero in the Resistance, and the Kelly Marie Tran character is going to look up to Finn and kind of be a supporter of his. So the thing is here with what they're telling us here is that Finn in the movie, at least, is going to start out, yeah, he's on the Resistance, but at some point in the movie, he's basically going to say, you know, enough of this, and his intention is to kind of go out to the Outer Rim or something to that degree is from what, what I'm getting from this, at least, and that he's basically planning to get out of the Resistance as well. Well, obviously, yeah, as he's stated before, he's done with the First Order, but now he's starting to get a little fed up with the Resistance. Now, whether that's going to be through some hypocrisy in the resistance with some of the leadership or if that's just him saying there's so much action around here I'm afraid I'm gonna get killed next thing I'm out of here one of those either way I think this is an interesting development for his character because you know obviously he got a lot to do in The Force Awakens he was actually probably one of the more important characters in there and I'd like to see what happens with him further on okay also we've got along with these kind of stories here we've got a couple of images I'll talk about a couple of those now the first one I mean this one is stealing everybody's heart and it's the thing about porgs and you know they're, they're kind of the gerbil looking things you know and they, they got a picture of one sitting next to Chewbacca and everything I'm gonna have to break some hearts here these things just don't do it for me I, I know what this is this is a pretty much just a studio mandate to put something cute and small in the movie to sell more toys. That's what this, I know that's a cynical view and everything, but that's all I'm getting out of this. They don't make my heart sword anything or anything. They don't tug on my heartstrings or anything. You know why? Because I actually had my heartstrings removed during a bypass surgery. I just don't get into these sort of things. You know, like the minions and stuff. I hate the minions. Absolutely hate them. I don't care if people call them adorable. I don't care if they look adorable. They have to actually do something. You know, they can't just be there to sell toys. You know, I, I'm, I'm I'm just not a fan of that idea. Then also we've got a really cool idea here and, and some really nice images here of the Praetorians. The Praetorians who basically come from this old, what did they say? It's kind of like a gladiatorial vocabulary of some kind or other. They're basically going to be Supreme Leader Snoke's guards. 
Now, I know a lot of people really got pissed off at this idea because they're like, why would Snoke need bodyguards? But hey, look at how powerful Emperor Palpatine was. He had guards. I mean, in both the prequels and the original trilogy, he had guards. Even though, yeah, they were just kind of there for show, they were there. You know, he had guards. That's what the main point of it here is. And I'm sure once we get Snoke in action and everything, which um, we might, I don't think he's just going to be this bad guy who through the whole trilogy just sits on a chair and then eventually gets blown up or something. I don't think that's the way they're going to go. But these guards look friggin' awesome. I mean, they're basically, they look like if chess was invented today, these are what the the pawns would look like. They look badass. I mean, they just look awesome. Again, if you haven't seen these yet, there a lot of these images are online now, or again, they're in the most recent edition of Entertainment Weekly. These things look cool. They actually look like they might serve a little bit of a purpose. Instead of a whole bunch of stormtroopers you got to take out, here, take out a couple of these Praetorian guards. And they look deadly too, man. You know, they've been compared to samurai and everything. So that's pretty cool. All right, next thing we'll talk about here what's going to happen with Poe Dameron? Because he was a character who, in The Force Awakens, really had an interesting start, and then he disappeared for half the movie to come back and kind of help lead the end battle and everything. So basically, in the issue here, Oscar Isaac's talking about it, he says that Poe is going to evolve in the movie from the soldier and the pilot to who could eventually somebody who becomes a leader in the Resistance. Now, I think that's the right move, because Oscar Isaac is a very gifted actor, and even though, yeah, the story didn't require a whole bunch of his presence in The Force Awakens, and actually in the original draft he was supposed to die after that first initial scene, they made him, I think, a really nice character, and somebody who I really want to see more of in the future movies. And basically, also, he kind of said that in the story, that Leia knows that she's not going to be with the Resistance forever, you know, eventually something's going to happen. So she wants to kind of push Poe from being that pilot to being a wise leader. And I know a lot of people are already going to jump on and say, well, this is just because of reshoots and stuff. I don't know. I mean, the script for this movie, we can't forget, was written way before Carrie Fisher passed. Probably 90% of her material was done by the time she passed. So I don't buy that idea at all. I think this was something that was in the story plans. Plus, it just makes sense for Leia as a character. She's never been an impulsive character. She's always kind of had a plan of some degree or another. Or even when things are tough and it looks like there's no escape, she calls down and boom she finds a way out of it so that i think that kind of fits into her pedigree here for wanting poe to become a resistance leader okay last thing we'll talk about here are a couple more details on dj this is the character played by benicio del toro now i know everybody including me at first initially thought when they cast benicio del toro in this especially coming off of his performance in sicario probably his best performance in over a decade where he was kind of a darker character everybody thought yeah they're going to cast him as a villain you know a lot of people were speculating is he going to be somebody who lasted through the end of the prequel era through the original trilogy and now he's coming back for vengeance and stuff is he an actual sith you know what is he so yeah initially i was thinking that with everybody else but then i thought about it a while and i'm like wait a minute if he was like a big bad guy like somebody who was going to be important to the story and not just a twist character you know somebody who starts out good and then becomes evil they would have told us by now because you know we knew early on that kylo ren played by adam driver was going to be a villain we got that also about Phasma. And once we learned who Snoke was, we knew he was an evil character. But here when they just revealed his name as DJ, you know, and they didn't really give us a faction or what side he was on and everything, I started to think, wait a minute, maybe he's a good guy then. And now we kind of get a couple more details here to where he's kind of somebody who's stuck in the middle. He doesn't really have a side. He kind of, you know, he'll work for one side or another side, depending on how much he gets paid, which kind of sounds initially like what Han Solo would have done back, you know, before he got all caught up in A New Hope and everything. So that, I think, is a very interesting idea and of course with Han Solo dead now in this universe and I doubt they're getting a force ghost for him so don't even start that conversation it's kind of like that leaves a little bit of a hole there and I think it'd be interesting to put a new version of that again I don't want a carbon copy of Han Solo here as played by Benicio Del Toro but I want somebody who's yeah who's kind of shifty like somebody you, you don't want to trust all the way because you never know maybe one day yeah he's working for you but then the next day the first order is going to give him a pay raise or something thing, you know. Obviously, Han Solo was somebody who knew that he didn't really have a heart for the Empire and everything. So yeah, that makes him somebody who's a Han Solo type, but who's a little more gray. You know, he's somebody who's not going to completely go with the Resistance just because he knows that they're probably the more civilized and the less 
evil of the two factions. No, he's somebody who's not above that. That's, I think, making for a really nice character, and I, I don't know if he's going to have a whole bunch of screen time in the movie. I'm just speculating this part, but I think he's somebody who would call back as a memorable character. Okay, so that's going to be all that's going to wrap up here. Of course, The Last Jedi hits theaters in December. We've got a lot of time to speculate about some stuff here. Almost four full months now to speculate. All right, next thing we'll talk about here is David Letterman. He's coming back to the media in this way. He's not going back on CBS or anything. He's not going back on cable or network television. No, he's going on Netflix. So basically what they've announced here is that this is going to be a six episode series where he's just going to be doing the same things he was doing for 30 plus years when he was on the Letterman show and whatever, you know, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, iterations and titles for what his shows were and everything. Kind of that whole idea, which is something, you know, Netflix is really evolving here lately into a streaming service that is not just about finding your favorite old TV show or a newer TV show on it and streaming it, binge watching it and everything. No, pretty much every new show they come out with that's a series has gotten at least two or three weeks of fame. You know, like this year, 13 Reasons Why was really popular for, you know, again, about a month or so. Now nobody's talking about it. But the same thing happened, you know, last year with Stranger Things. That one picked up and was, you know, a lot longer and still people are talking about it today. And obviously we got the second season coming up this fall. And with Glow recently, that was one that hit it big that people are still talking about. Obviously there's a few clunkers here and there but you know that's the way it goes with anything these days netflix has really become an area to where yeah we're gonna get a lot of great content here and there that's not just old stuff or network stuff or stuff from other companies a lot of it is original programming now that's become the most popular and most watched things on netflix and you know now we're getting almost every day new stories and stuff about netflix original films you know we've got martin scorsese's there i, I can't even name how many other big directors are going there but a lot lot of the bigger directors who maybe initially were getting some pushback from studios on ideas for films, Netflix is a little more flexible in that regard. So I think Netflix has has kind of started to really evolve into something that I think will become the next big thing. Now, I don't want to really over blast this or anything, but it's like we had radio back in the you know, late 20s, early 30s, through the 40s and stuff. That was the big entertainment thing for family audiences at home. Then we got television, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s, you know, through the 60s and everything, and up to today, obviously. You know, and then eventually we get, you know, some home video markets like VHS, Beta. Eventually we get Laserdisc, DVD, Blu-ray, everything else through today. Now I think Netflix and other streaming devices like Amazon and Hulu and all the rest of them, they're the next step. And Netflix, I think, is still at the center of that and still the paramount of everything in the streaming services. So in that regard, to see David Letterman come back and to pick Netflix as the next thing he's going to do and the big streaming service that he's going to go out on, at least on this new adventure. Well, number one, I'm subscribed to Netflix. So yeah, that's obviously a great thing too. But also it's a Another thing that Netflix can add to its belt of part of its programming. It's now got original series. It's got a lot of original films. You know, we've seen War Machine and a couple others like Okja or whatever it was called. I, I haven't seen it yet. But, you know, the original films are starting to crank out now. Now we could be getting into a territory of commentary news like what Letterman does and everything and the late night kind of stuff. Now they're covering just about every quadrant. The only other thing would be political talk and kind of those other daytime discussion shows or game shows, you know, kind of those. But it's like they've covered just about every other quadrant of the major entertainment things that any network would cover. So that is a really exciting step, I think, for Netflix. And plus, you know, David Letterman is somebody who more recently I've been watching a lot of his older stuff, like his whole Taco Bell, working at Taco Bell in the drive through thing. That is probably my favorite all-time TV sketch post-Carson that ever aired. I mean, I watch that thing probably once or twice a week. It is terrific. And, you know, there's older stuff, you know, back when he was on in the early to mid-80s, you know, a lot of his old stuff there, like the Andy Kaufman situation with Larry the King Lawler is a really popular video people watch, how they got into a big brawl and big 
argument on his show. I mean, that's terrific. And, you know, everything, like, back in the day, and I've, again, been watching this recently for whatever reason, but after 9-11, when Letterman kind of went back on and how he treated everything and his guests and everything and the questions he was asking and the statements he was making, I feel he did that better than any other late-night journalist did. And I wasn't, after that, I didn't really become, like, a regular watcher of his show or anything because I was pretty young when he was still on the air and everything. And when he went off in 2015, I did watch the last show and I kind of realized, wait a minute, so this is the first time I've been alive that Letterman has not been on TV. And it was kind of an odd feeling that I had then. And now to hear that he's coming back, hopefully, yeah, he can get back to that kind of fun style that he had back, well, I I don't know if there's a rough year, but probably like before 97 or whatever. It was kind of like, there was like a point there where CBS kind of really started to rein him down a little bit. And he wasn't as wild. He wasn't doing his sketch. You know, the sketches weren't as funny as they were. Like me, I'm a movie guy, so all the sketches he did and all the time that Siskel and Ebert were on his show, those I can watch and I love them. And especially the one where they go around door to door in Jersey and stuff, that sketch, terrific. Go and watch that if you haven't. It's really funny. And it's only four minutes, so it's a short one. But it's like after that, he kind of just kind of laid back and of course, you know, 9-11 and all that made him very uneasy and everything that was happening in the government made him very uneasy and everything and it he just, you know, his personality changed and everything and as he was getting older now, was, you know, everything about his show was changing. It's like if he can get back to that stuff he was doing before that then I'll really, really, really be excited and it'll be probably one of the best things on Netflix. But even still, if he's doing the same thing or he's maybe more like he was, you know, in the last couple of years there, you know what? Still, it's it's good to have him back, maybe not on the air, but on streaming services like Netflix. Now, of course, uh, I'll close here with what could have been the biggest story in news this week in the uh, media entertainment kind of thing. And that was what's happening with Disney and their their own streaming service. They're planning to launch their own streaming service. Now, Disney, of course, is a company. You know, they own Marvel. They own Star Wars and all that. They own Pixar. And, of course, they have their own programming and everything with their own movies and stuff. And they've got their own channel and everything. they got a lot of stuff going on. And, of course, the theme parks and everything. So it makes sense that they want to branch out and further dominate the market with a streaming service. But my big question was, okay, so, yeah, that means obviously stuff like Moana... Frozen, you know, the more recent ones that are original properties, and probably the Pixar stuff, because a lot of that does draw back onto Disney and everything. Those, I thought, were really obvious choices for what they're going to put on as programming on this new streaming service. But now we're kind of getting some later details here to where some of the Marvel and the Star Wars stuff, Netflix wants to keep those, and Disney and Netflix are kind of entering negotiations to try and figure out a way to where, yeah, the Marvel and Star Wars stuff because there is some stuff on Netflix at this point. Because Marvel, you know, with their TV universe right now, with the Defenders coming up, you got all the standalones and Punisher and everything else, they would probably be in their best interest to keep that stuff on Netflix. And Star Wars, you know, they have like the Clone Wars series, I think is still on Netflix, and there's a couple other things, and obviously Rogue One just got put on Netflix. So those, I think, again, they're in the best interest of Marvel and of Star Wars as their own separate production companies to be staying on Netflix and not going over to this Disney, service, you know, whatever it's going to be. And I think that's, again, I think that's the smartest move here. I don't think it's smart for Marvel and for Star Wars to pull everything off Netflix and make people subscribe to this new Disney thing, even though there are some people out there who just don't dig the Disney or the Pixar stuff, and they're more into the Marvel and Star Wars stuff. I'm somebody who happens to like, you know, a little bit of everything in those, but honestly, I don't see myself being a subscriber to this Disney streaming thing, you know, at all. Because the way it sounds they're going to do like Netflix is doing now their own programming and stuff with their own original series eventually maybe they'll get some of their movies on there as well and I mean new movies not you know old ones classics I'm sure classics will be on there too like go back to Pinocchio Snow White all those older ones plus the 90s ones Beauty and the Beast Little Mermaid I'm sure those will all be on there but I'm talking brand new ideas those I think would be on there too and as well it could be a way to shut down the Disney Channel division and put all of those shows the classic ones and some new ideas again onto this new streaming service courtesy of Disney. So, you know, this, again, it's kind of that next step for Disney is they're big enough now, they believe, and yeah, I mean, I I think it'll work. I think it's not going to be a catastrophe by any means, and it's still a couple years out. But yeah, I think they are big enough, they can afford it and everything, to put a new streaming service together. Now, again, I'm probably not going to subscribe. It's probably going to be like a $15 service a month or whatever, and it's like a lot of that stuff, like I can pick up a Blu-ray for some of the classic Disney stuff that I like. 
or I can go to the theater because I don't think they're going to start pulling their theatrical releases and putting them straight on their streaming. I don't think that's the way that's going to work. You know, but if it's a big enough movie that I'm interested in, like some of the Pixar stuff and all those other things like their live action remakes and everything, I think those will stay theatrical releases. I don't see any notion of Disney canceling that at all or Disney going back on that. I That would be the dumbest decision they could ever make. But those I can see in the theater and then eventually buy them on Blu-ray or whatever. As long as they don't do that, if they start taking that away and saying oh there's actually not going to be a home distribution model here instead once it's released for everybody to see at home the only way is through the stream that's when i'll start to have a problem there but as long as they still release blu-rays dvds and all that of their movies that are going to be theatrical and again as long as they keep them released theatrically like that i don't see any problem with this and even though yeah it's probably not going to be my most anticipated thing or anything i'm probably not going to subscribe to it it's still a really interesting development here and again kind of a big step for Disney here and again just a sign that streaming services have become the new best thing as far as home entertainment. All right guys well this has kind of been a longer episode here so I'm going to close that out now. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we go. If you have any ideas or discussion points you want brought up on the show you can leave a comment here on YouTube otherwise I do have a Gmail account set up that's Plagman Rules Podcast at gmail.com P-L-A-G-M-A-N-R-U-L-E-S podcast at gmail.com again any discussion points or or ideas ideas that you want to leave you can leave them there through an email or here on youtube also let me know what you think of the show is it any good or are you really bored by what we're talking about just let me know that again you can leave a comment or go and leave an email all right so we'll be back again on monday we'll talk about what happens at the box office this weekend a lot of new movies opening up some of them will probably do okay other ones might flop but we'll see what happens and uh any other big movie news we'll get into that breaks over the weekend or anything like that we'll talk about we'll see what happens All right, this has been the Plagman Rules Podcast.